have to be. Um, <laughs> yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. The microphone. Yeah. Okay. My name's Edie. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to have the sincere pleasure of introducing Jay and Sarah. Um, first, we're going to hear from Sarah, and Sarah Sutter um, is a writer, educator, student, and psychonaut based in Portland, Oregon. Sarah holds a BA in philosophy, an MFA in poetry and creative nonfiction, and is now in their second year at California Institute of Integral Studies, where they are focusing on somatic and psychedelic assistive therapy. I zoomed in way too far. Sarah teaches literature and creative writing at University of Portland, Pacific Northwest College of Art and Craft, Willamette University, and virtually at Harrisburg Area Community College. While Sarah's most recent writings have been toward fulfilling academic requirements, published works appear in Fence, the Seattle Review, Nailed Magazine, and others, along with her chapbooks, Oh, to be a dragon and siren nomelia. Sarah is slowly at work on a new hybrid project that explores the generative and spiritual qualities of trauma. Please welcome Sarah. Hi, everyone. Hi. Good evening. Nice to see you all. Um, I love being a PNCA. I'm feeling so enlivened so far, working with some folks I met in the winter and some new students as well. Um, I just love this program and Jay, thanks so much for having me. Um, Jay and I chatted um, over coffee as we do from time to time and have been for 10 years actually. Uh, we're both reading tonight and talked about what we should read, and we thought of some prompts, tried to think of some prompts, and both landed, I think, mostly with grief um, as sort of a core tenet and thread. And I'll share tonight a new piece that is, um, it's uh, more prose than poetry, and it's a piece that is some family history. Um, yeah, from my mother's side. It's a new work and it's, um, it's called Aloysius. The name seems to mean warrior. It was my grandfather's, my mother's father, the boy who got pulled out of seventh grade because he showed so much promise. School was a waste of time when that mind could be put to the business. Said business was running the butcher shop under Magdalena's watch, his mother and my great grandmother. She left the valleys of the Swiss Alps in 1909 for the American rumors moving on the winds whistling through her town. A valley girl, but when I see her in photos, she has the gravitas of a widowed butcher's wife. Short, strong, and long raven hair she combed with a bone. My uncle spoke of peeking in on her at the end of a long work day when she would unclip her hair and let it fall to her back small. I see my uncle then, the boy with the roundest face and ruddy cheeks, wondering about the species of adult and her pinned back wildness. They were people who sold beasts. Before Aloysius belonged to my grandfather, the name belonged to his father, my great-grandfather, Aloysius, the first husband of Magdalena. They immigrated together, bringing their trade of butchery, but this life of their journey together ended abruptly. Just after finding a storefront and a place to call home in a valley of Northeast Pennsylvania, Aloysius was at the slaughterhouse. And just as he was about to slit a steer's throat, it gouged his guts with its horns. This led to severe internal bleeding. So severe, Aloysius died shortly after. So Magdalena was a widow with a baby and a butcher shop in a new country. And no one tells the story of her grief or the desperation she must have felt 
or what it was for Aloysius to lose his father before he could speak, to be forced into his trade and manhood without ever knowing the source. What they do tell is of John Breyer, the firefighter from across the street, a widower and father of three, a customer who married Magdalena. I have a photo of the house where my grandfather Aloysius and I both grew up 60 years apart and the same house where I later lived with him as he unraveled, returned to a kind of youth, the slow crawl of his dying. In the photo, Aloysius' wife, Ruth, sits in a rocking chair on the porch, watching as their son stands at the gate. The house is half illuminated, half in shadow. One afternoon, Aloysius was carrying a 60 pound slab of meat over his shoulder and he crumpled under the weight. Never stop the car or the engine won't, won't turn back over, he would say. And so he worked until the wheels fell off. Around this time, Aloysius also came down with Alzheimer's. It seemed a process the adults saw but couldn't know. I saw Nana Ruth seeing it. And for her, it was mostly more fodder for their love language of criticism. How could he forget the milk so many times? Where was his mind? She passed long before his mundane forgetfulness bloomed into his new consciousness. Afternoons, I would be watching the register, weighing out kielbasa and borscht, cleaning the shelves, and Aloysius would call me over, whispering, as though not to disturb someone. When I got close to his tweed chair, his cloudy blue eyes scattered with light, he would point, look at the bunny rabbit. The first time he did this, I turned my head in belief, thudding as they landed on a crumpled paper bag. In that moment, I made a decision I would stand by. I turned back to him, it's so cute. <laughs> When Aloysius was an eighth grader in the school of butchery, one of his lessons was slitting the throats of chickens each morning and hanging them in the back kitchen for cleaning, parsing, selling. By the time I was a child in that same house, I would wander past the back kitchen and the chicken coop was still there. My mother had planted a lilac bush near the concrete rectangle and gifted me two albino bunnies. Their shocks of white fur and pink eyes peeked out from the coop shadows into the sunlit backyard where I contemplated how Aloysius could once be a kid like me with animals like these bunnies. What did his young mind have to do to carry out such work? Maybe it wasn't until his unraveling that his mind could allow him to see the sweetness of such creatures. Maybe because he was so close to death, he could see my late pets. There were a few trees on our block, though all the streets had names like cedar, chestnut, and birch. In the space between the butchery and the house, I managed to find snapdragons shooting out of the earth and through cinder block piles. I would sit there and feel the velvety flower flesh, sometimes picking each bloom off and adorning my fingers with them. Those days I would wander into the basement and crawl spaces of the shop, often landing outside the old pen they had filled with coal. I would fill a fist with the black rocks, make sure, pretend they were a type of precious gem. I would feel the edges pushing into my skin and let them drop slowly between my fingers back into the sea with all the others. Summer swimming by chain link fences and blackberry brambles, jumping off decks time and again into chlorinated caverns. It wasn't unusual to land a splinter in the foot or hand. And without hesitation, all the adults would say, you better go see Butchie. Butchie was their name for Aloysius, who upon sight of the sliver in my skin would slip into a focused trance. He would pull a long sewing needle from a case under the knives and hold it over a flame. He would ask for my affected limb, tell me to look away. And before I could think past the question of what pain to expect, he would say, all right, you're all done, Gertrude. <laughs> Later, I would hear the story of how Butchie learned to translate his skills to the human body. 
As a soldier in World War II, he was stationed in Trinidad in a hospital where he worked as a surgeon. A surgeon, a boy they pulled out of the seventh grade. Time became his enemy. Every few minutes, he turned his head up over his left shoulder, peering up from that tweed chair in the corner of the kitchen to, clock, to the clock over the door, and sometimes immediately, or sometimes after sitting and pondering, he would turn away. Always in disgusted disbelief, how could it only be the time that it was? How could only four minutes have passed? We started taking Aloysius for car rides, which helped to move, him, move time around him in ways that mirrored how the life inside him had changed its moving. He would point out the window to a squat brick building. That used to be the bowling alley. Oh, where's the baseball diamond now? My old friend Thomas lived in a house on that corner once. The kaleidoscope of his memory. He had never pointed any of these things out before his mind was lost. It was like the unmooring of the present set older parts, past lives, free. We slept with just a wall between our heads, and I would wake as his bed shook with his body seeking balance in the reaching for the chamber pot. Several nights, I dreamed about him in the kind of heaven I had been taught. Aloysius in a house of cumulus, bathed in golden light, and selling golden hot dogs from a golden hot dog stand. <laughs> the dream and spirit realms have a sense of humor. No one seemed capable, though, of talking to Aloysius about death. I would overhear him and his children as they would be helping to dress him and feed him, and Aloysius, in moments of many misses, in a strange time, a strange place, a name forgotten, an agelessness, an unmoored soul in an unordered ocean of one's life receding. Aloysius would say in his despair, oh, just let me die already. And of course, his child, now caretaker, must have felt so scared and so hurt and grief-stricken to hear this from their father, to hear this in our culture of avoiding death, avoiding talk of it, avoiding the feelings associated with it, they would respond with a shield of anger, wanting him to just get better, to not talk like that. How terribly and unnecessarily lonely to move toward your death while those around you pretend it's not happening. How terribly human to need to do so. The other night I had a dream that I was back in the butchery and I saw a boy behind the counter. I didn't recognize him, wondered who he could be. He appeared in grayscale, like a person who had stepped out of an old photo. At the front of the store, the windows and doors were trembling against the weight of a vibrant jungle pulsing just beyond them. Vines and flora, an electric verdure creeping in over the black and white tiles. Aloysius' youngest daughter, Lily, had me when she was quite young. For the beginning of my life, Lily raised me without my father, but Aloysius was always there. Like many children, only learning about the wounds of their elders in retrospect, I realized recently that both Aloysius and me were fatherless children. I wonder how this was both painful and healing for him to help to father me. Did he think of his father, Aloysius, whose choices and absence shaped so much of his own young life? Did he feel that wound and the transformative power of providing for me in his community? I would sit on the milk crate next to his seat in the delivery truck on the way to school. After school, I would hang around the shop with him and the old neighbor men, widows and veterans, who passed their afternoons in the shop sipping milky coffee. If I wanted to bake a cake or play with clay, Aloysius was happy to clear the block. If I wanted to practice my cornet, he would mostly smile through the cacophony. <laughs> if I needed help with long division homework, we would all put our heads together and try to understand how divisors and remainders worked. <laughs> Aloysius would sometimes tell the story of how he quit smoking. 
He was at the doctor one day and the doc asked, how much do you smoke? Aloysius responded, two packs a day, camels. <laughs> then the doctor said, well, you should really cut back. So Aloysius picked the pack of smokes from his breast pocket, handed them over to the doctor and never had another one since. <laughs> <laughs> I overheard Aloysius and my mom talking one day. I must have been about seven. You know, she tells me she loves me all the time, he said. Well, she must really love you then. I heard her respond, and I imagine it was with pride. And though I was apparently fluent in love, I never heard my mom and my grandfather, father and daughter, name their love to each other. I see them now as children then, too. Aloysius, a child, in his always waiting for the childhood he never had. The opportunity to feel loved, held. Stepping into his namesake, warrior, out of duty rather than choice. And though Aloysius gave his children so much more than he had ever been given, will continue to hurt in him, need attending, the kind that only his kids could give him. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Can't wait to hear from you, Jay. Thanks, Sarah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to crack you open a new one. Yeah. No, this one's different. Thank you. <laughs> I'm trying to get like the lump out of my body <laughs> that story um, in the best way. But uh, next up, we have the very beloved Jay Contieri. <laughs> Um, Jay directed the creative writing program at Merrill Hurst University from 2008 to 2018 and is now the program head of PNCA's low residency creative writing program. His book of creative nonfiction, Someone Told Me, has just been published by Widow and Orphan House. He's also the author of Dark Mouth Inside Me and Wedlocked which received an Oregon Book Award for Creative Nonfiction. Two of Ponteri's essays, Listen to This and On Naval Gazing, have earned notable mentions in Best American Essay Anthologies. His work has also appeared in many literary journals, Gaze, Ghost Proposal, I Rhyme, Seattle Review, Forklift, Ohio, Knee Jerk, Cimarron Review, Tin House, Clackamas Literary Review. While teaching at Merrill Hurst, Ponteri was twice awarded the Excellence in Teaching and Service Award. In 2007, Ponteri founded Show Tell, the workshop for teen artists and writers, now part of summer programming at Portland's Independent Publishing Resource Center, on whose resource council he serves. He teaches memoir classes at Literary Arts. He lives with his son Oscar in Oscar's hug mode. <laughs> Please also change. There's actually a former teen camper here tonight. <laughs> um now an adult. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Edie, and thank you, Sarah. That was really, that was really great, beautiful. Uh, and it's an honor to share this space with you in this way. Um, so, and also there's three others of me in this crowd right now. I think they're seated, they're seated near each other. So we'll see if you can locate them here. Um, I have two pieces, or no, I should say I have two more pieces. 
The first is an artist statement. And actually, um, my friend Sharita Town, who I'll dedicate tonight's reading to, she made these beautiful um, little handbound zines. And there's a bunch of them over here. So if you would like to take one um, before you leave, you should take one. I mean, they're not for syrup, they're for sale, they're for, for free. Um, <laughs> but it's just basically the first piece that I'm going to read tonight. No pressure. Artist statement. We are in line, the three of us. We're moving closer to the front of the line that now appears in sight. We've known about the front of the line and what happens there. We have witnessed others experience it. We're familiar with the concept and the order of things. It was not too long ago, we remember so clearly, when we were at the back, when the line felt impossibly long and crowded with others waiting ahead of us, to the extent that the front was not visible. It felt as if we would never reach the front, that the point was to always be in the never ending crowded back part. Then we began to notice that there were lots of folks behind us and that in this new spot, the deep middle, the line began to speed up. Our motion felt continuous, swift, like we could for the first time feel ourselves in motion. Then one day the front of the line appeared. It was startling to see. There it was, small and big at once, the space where the three of us would step into another space. A new space, and yet the front of the line still felt a ways away until it began to feel close. Now there are only a few others ahead of us. The front of the line feels right there, not upon us, but upon us. Our son, his mom, and I are now beginning to prepare for what happens when we get to the front. There are workers there. We didn't see them before to help us do this preparatory work, more focused on what our son will do and not so much what his mom and I will do. What we'll do, we cannot prepare for. We only know we'll no longer be in this line, or perhaps we'll join a different one. The workers give us directions on what will happen when we arrive at the front. We say goodbye to our son, then he steps out of the line first and walks away from us without turning back as we watch him move away from us till we can no longer see him. And then we are to say goodbye to each other and she'll turn right and I left and we'll walk away from each other. We'll no longer be in line. Neither of us. Neither of us knowing where we'll be or where to go from there. We ask the workers if we can, as we walk away, turn back to look at each other, and they remain silent. Amid grief, uh, this is the second piece. Um, amid grief, I comfort myself with memories of connection. Unplug and wrap the cords. Clear the soiled plates from the tables. 
and load them in the dishwasher and start it up. Pick up the wet towels and toss them in the laundry hamper. Stack the chairs and move them back against the wall beneath the stairwell. Wipe the counters, strip the beds, dust the handrails. To reintroduce air to the filling, fluff the pillows. Snake the bathroom and shower drains and pull clumps and clumps and clumps of hair from the pipes and add them to the garbage. <laughs> Gather the cushions from the patio furniture and store them in the garage. Sweep the ash from the fireplace and close the flue. Fasten the billows to its hook. Return the sprinkler heads and rake and shovel and pickaxe and wheelbarrow to the shed. Roll up the garden hose and hang it on the hook against the shed wall. Remove the deck from the lake and store it in the shed beneath the tarpaulin. Karen's mom made us hot cocoa and plates of Christmas cookies and set us up in an upstairs room, a bedroom made into a den, a name you don't hear to describe rooms anymore. And that gave off a kind of masculine vibe, perhaps a suburban precursor to the man cave. Carpeted floor, a love seat and rocking chair, and atop a dresser stuffed with off-season clothing in it was a smaller TV referred to as the second TV. The larger one being in the family room downstairs that we now just call the TV room. And maybe a desk or shelves with photos, additional storage space for smaller items, not necessarily broken, but perhaps already replaced. Christmas lights, colored bulbs, framed the window and they twinkled beyond the light of the TV as Karen and I watched a movie, a rented VHS tape or something they recorded off TV. This was before people began to procure copies of movies, sitting on the floor beneath the love seat, leaning against the front of its cushions. Did we sit on the floor, a directive from Karen's mom, out of a fear we might spill our hot cocoa on the fabric of the love seat? Or perhaps we were just being kids who loved sitting on the floor where we could stretch out and roll over. The love seat would have framed us as a couple, and we lived beyond that definition, as children who are friends often do. I remember yellow lamplight and the light of the TV and the lights twinkling in the window as we watched a Christmas movie and blanketed each other in a quiet sweetness that opened up the space for both of us, allowing our bodies to relax and connect and laugh. And even though we sat close to each other, our arms did not touch as we were both shy and rare for most of us humans, exactly in the place we wanted to be. Everything else slipping away. Death and severance slipping away. My grandfather's expired body. All the ends slipping away. The end of childhood. The end of my parents. Um, wow, the end of my parents' marriage out there in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. Just our child selves sitting on the floor, sipping warm chocolate and feeling the connection our bodies made. Mm -hmm. The lights twinkling, nothing sexual here for I was prepubescent still, late bloomer, just a kind of raw, unfettered intimacy. That little boy making a connection in the face of and through loss, in absence, in presence.
Over the course <clears throat> of Oscar's first summer and into autumn, 10 months to one year old, we'd walk the Concordia neighborhood of Northeast Portland. I'd strap Oscar into his baby Bjorn. You all know what those things are. Like <laughs> and we'd roam for two to three hours, sometimes more. Conical lavender shoots brushing our shoulders, pink begonia petals lighting the pavement, a hot breeze shaking birch willow boughs, rhododendron and rosemary, cool shaded tunnels of overhanging bamboo. In the alleys, we peek into backyards, at art studios, a field of plastic toys strewn in high grass, swimming pools, air streams, brush piles, wood piles, piles of moat mulch, plant boxes with tomatoes and cucumbers and basil, all these hidden landscapes, like looking out the window of a moving train. When the heat reached the hundreds, we'd retreat to the Kennedy School, roaming the air-conditioned hallways, looking at the photos of school children on ball fields in musical productions, eating in the cafeteria, entire classes and staff photographed standing together. When we began these walks, he'd face into my chest because his neck muscles were not strong enough for him to hold up his head on his own. As we'd walk, as I'd walk carrying him, I gently hold the back of his head in my hand to keep his head in place. Eventually, his neck muscles formed and strengthened. That is, he could hold up, he could hold his neck up without the help of his parents. And I turned around his body so he faced the world, could feel the world more fully. Imagine this. First, facing into my chest, looking at nothing but the cloth of the carrier garment. Then the world surrounding him emerges. Mm -hmm. One day, we help hold up his head, and the next day, he can do it on his own. <laughs> I remember feeling the feeling of his body pressing into my chest, his flight weight pulling on my shoulders, his feet jostling the edges of my belly. I can still feel his head in the palm of my hand. Put the chairs up on the table shake out and roll up the floor mats, sweep and mop the floors, unplug the toaster, wring out the sponges, toss the soiled wet rags into the hamper, open the dishwasher and unload the plates, glasses, bowls, cups, and silverware, returning them to their cabinets and drawers. If there are thunder showers in the, in the forecast, close the bedroom windows to keep the stripped mattresses dry. Roll all the computer cards, this is PNCA, roll all the computer <laughs> cards back to the storage room on the third floor and return the cameras and projectors to IT on the fifth floor. <laughs> Reconcile the charges. <laughs> Wipe down the drawer pulls and light switches. Pick up from the floor and fold the garments he left, the ones he chose not to take with him, and return them to his wardrobe. Shut the door to his wardrobe. Listen for the click the magnets make as they touch. Wipe the crumbs from the kitchen table into the cup of your hand.
In Richard Linklater's film, Boyhood, a scene towards the end captures the feelings of incredulity to which this particular grief experience, experience is presently giving way. Patricia Arquette plays the mother, and she and her son, no longer a boy, now a man, about to head off to college, are in the kitchen of her new condo, navigating some sort of ordinary logistic when she sits down at the table and breaks down crying. The boy, now a young man, doesn't understand what's wrong, nor does he know how to console her, and she doesn't ask him to. And she says something like, I thought there would be more time. And that's it, exactly. I thought there would be more time. It's not that you mistakenly planned on there being more time. You always knew how much time there would be. It's that your body in this moment feels as if there were more time together. Your body feels this other body with it in this moment and anticipates feeling it in the next. It's been there for such a long time that it feels like it's always been there and always will be there. Which is to say your body is orienting itself in relation to this other body, the boy's body, now a young man's body. In the film's ending, Link later moves his protagonist beyond the parents. He drives himself to college, the college he's attending. And once there, he meets his roommate in the dorm who invites him to hang out with him, his girlfriend and another friend. And they drive out to high plains looking rock croppings where they take LSD and wander about it's late summer, and they're just four human beings exploring their new surroundings. And for him, even with the acid trip, there's nothing that unusual. He's just hanging out with new friends, just doing the next thing. He doesn't, or maybe he does, understand that he and his parents have co-created this generative space for him to focus on that next thing. The parents have done their best not to hamper him with the things he has left behind. And he has worked hard to make a life for himself beyond the walls of his parents' houses. And there's such beauty to this, a form of freedom. Not everybody gets this knowing that Oscar will have a similar experience, a sequence of instances far beyond our perceptual fields, a space time, a space time for him to attend to the next thing, to let us go, barely realizing he's doing so, as he makes a life of his very own, one with many new connections we may never know, one we can only vaguely imagine, about which he can tell us, share with us when we visit one another. Perhaps Amy and I shall play the role of advisor here and there. Perhaps we will comfort him when he needs to be comforted by his parents. Perhaps we will continue our many conversations, but mostly we will become already are eager listeners. He will tell us, already is telling us, the story of his life. Toss out the rotting vegetables, the spent coffee pods, the bread heels neither of us eat. 
the nearly empty ketchup bottles and mustard bottles and mayo. Give the plants a good watering. Reshell books piling up on multiple surface surfaces. Cancel the cable package. Empty the trash cans. Check the front and back doors to make sure they're locked. Walk from room to room, snapping off all of the lights. Turn on the hallway, hallway light he always left on, then snap it off again. Turn it on again, then snap it off again. Do this a few times to remember that you did this, that all of this actually happened and you remained with him till the last possible moment, till it was just you. Thank you all for looking at um, uh, Thank you again, Sarah, for sharing this experience with me. Um, if you all want some artist statements, they're just in this box. I'll put them on the table. Um, so we have tomorrow night, um, our dynamic duo is reading uh, Jason Gabbert and Shannon Gillespie. Um, we'll be reading tomorrow night. Um, on Thursday, Diana Coy Nguyen, who is our guest artist, will be reading um, so that's going to be an amazing event. And then the triad of ultimate power will be reading on Friday evening. So that's just going to be incredible. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.